Welcome. I'm uh, Dave Annie Saltzman, the Director of Public Programming. So excited to welcome you to this conversation Tuesday at 4 p.m. with Rajni Ferreira. Before we begin, and I have the pleasure of introducing Rajni, I'd like to acknowledge even in the digital space where we are working and living, we are on the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, and the dish with one, sp one spoon wampum belt covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably care for the land around the Great Lakes. I'd like to just acknowledge we are in a continual process and conversation around decolonization and cultural space, and the acknowledgement is a small step in that. Without further ado, can I welcome uh, an amazing artist and dear friend, Rajni Pereira. Hi. All of, hi, Rajni. Hi. Well, thanks <laughs> How's for it joining going? us. Of course. Going well. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, I think everyone knows Rajni, but that just might be me. So for those who don't, I'd like to, yes, she's saying no. I'd like to tell you a little <laughs> bit about her. Um, other than growing up in Scarborough in North York and coming to Toronto from Sri Lanka when you were nine, Rajni? Wow, this is awesome, yes. <laughs> Rajni was born in Sri Lanka in 1985 and lives and works in Toronto. Her work explores issues of hybridity, sacrilege and irreverence, indexical sciences, ethnography, gender, sexuality, popular culture, deities, monsters, and dream worlds. All of these themes marry in a newly objectified realm of mythical symbiosis, made to act as Pereira's personal record of impossible discoveries. Her work actively engages in discussions with the viewing audience about the aesthetic treatment of gender and the non-European sacred and secular body in a cultural context. Thus her work creates a subversive aesthetic that counteracts oppressive discourse and acts as a restorative force through which people can move out of repressive modes of being towards reclaiming their power. I love that. Raj, your work has been exhibited everywhere at MOCA, at MAM and Rio at Art Metropole, Gallery 44, AGYU, um, OTA Fine Arts in Tokyo, the list goes on and on, the Colombo Biennale, the Netherlands, Art Dubai, Scope Basel, and you are represented by Patel, um, Brown. Patel Brown now. Uh, not so I'm self-represented and he would be my primary dealer. He is your primary dealer. So yeah. welcome Rajni, that is your Thank introduction. You yeah, long time coming to do something like this together. It's my pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, this conversation is really checking in with, with artists, writers, thinkers, community members about how you're doing and works that speak to you in this moment during COVID. So firstly, how are you doing? Yeah, um, oh my God, I'm, I'm doing interestingly. Uh, you know, I've been, I've kind of moved, this is a new apartment that I'm in, and I had to find this in probably the worst housing market, rental market, uh, in probably history in Toronto, and then after I found it, I, I moved, like, in the first week of lockdown, so, mm -hmm. so there are still things that I don't have, like, curtain rods and stuff, <laughs> such strange things, so, so, um, yeah, I've just been in here and like making my life as peaceful as I can. My daughter, I have an eight-year-old daughter and she's in Thornhill with her dad and his parents. So, you know, there's that like very particular type of like solitude that I'm really and have been enjoying quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and like, really making use of the time and questioning things like needs, need for productivity like questioning things like my self-worth, looking into, you know, my confidence levels and what affects that. Um, so for that reason, and I know that it's necessary for me and all of us to be at home and stay, please stay safe and please stay home um, as much as you can. Um, but but uh, it's actually been uh, kind of amazing in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. So a period of enjoyed it. I feel a little guilty about how how much I like this. I really like it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a true reflective quiet space. Yeah. Yeah. Like. 100 and like I'm right next to High Park. So outside of my window you can't see here but it's just a tree canopy and like all these beautiful birds all day long from morning till and evening. green. Yeah, and green. Yeah, you got it. Nice. 
Rajni, Rut, um, we'll get back to kind of the gen. Oh, I lost you for a second. Yeah. We're going to get back to um, kind of creative practice and this generative, potentially generative moment. But for people who are watching who don't necessarily aren't as familiar with your work, I wanted to share um, a piece and talk about it a little bit more. Is that um, so? I'm going to just share Fresh Air, uh, which you did in 2019, which was um, your first work, I think, your first work ever acquired by the AGO. And I feel lucky that it's in our space. So I'm just going to share this. And I'd love to just have you talk a little bit about this series and how it speaks to you. Yeah, so, so Fresh Air is one of the latest arrivals to a series called Traveler, which I've been working on since I think like 2019, it's like a two year old series. Um, and the first Traveler made uh, its appearance in a show called Mother World Creates and Destroys Itself. And that was at the time that Patel Brown Gallery was Patel Gallery run by Devin Patel. And, uh, and, you know, I never expected to, this is going to sound really weird. I never expected to make this type, the, the way that this mythology has come up, I didn't expect it to come up like that. Like I, I was thinking about something, I was thinking about a, just a being um, in the future. And then I realized as I was painting this person, how much of my, how much of my hopefulness about 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 the future for immigrants and like and like displaced bodies was being projected into this this painting and I realized that I was mutating this person I realized that I was heavily ornamenting and decorating this person so you know it sold really quickly actually my you know Alex McLeod the artist has that first piece and um and I was like oh damn you know I really love this series I want to keep painting this and then it's a now a huge series that's replete with like that's complete with sculpture there's like there's like all sorts of objects and things from this from this universe uh my work can be a little bit self represent self referential so I'll go back to paintings and I'll want to manifest something from that world into into uh, three into three dimensions, or like bring it further. That's the thing about world building. Like you just want to keep reaching and bringing things forward, reaching back and bringing things forward. So, and Rajni, I'm just showing these are two more in the series, correct? Yeah. And so the, for the one that's on I don't know what side. Yeah, the one that's on the right side is the first ever traveler, and then the one on the left is the I think the second one. Um, those both showed at Art Toronto in 2018 like after the exhibition. So it was for me in 2018, the fall of 2018 was MoCA, Mother World Creates and Destroys Itself and Art Toronto all butted up against one another. Um, and a big moment for you in terms of kind of acquisitions, whether it was from yeah. bank, bank collections or museums. Yeah. And actually, let me ask this now. Um, you, for a long time, you self-organized and self-curated you curated and self-organized your own exhibitions, you yeah. hustled. How has kind of mainstream acquisition or that bumper year changed or influenced your practice? My work itself? No, no, it has not. How about you yourself? I mean, there is a certain, like I worked really hard for that type of security and stability financially, so I enjoy it. I'm enjoying it and I'm enjoying sleeping a lot better at night and like feeding my kid better food and stuff like when I started when I started my practice, I was incredibly poor. <laughs> so like, so like, this is really nice. I can make rent. Like, it's really good, you know? Yeah. Um, it also makes me hopeful for my future in terms of like, you know, uh, one thing that I really want to do is that it's not a, it's not a plan or a dream I would have had before is uh, purchase land in, in, in the place where I come from, get buy land in Sri Lanka and like have something uh, for me and my family and like my daughter like that's not something I thought would happen but now it looks like it's kind of within reach or something and so, that's a dream that's a dream of yours to have a space in well kind I'd of like to buy something here the Vianney but we know how we all know what that's all about we know what that's like um but yeah it's been it's been wonderful how has it changed my practice I mean i I haven't really compromised on my vision like i that's my, you know, I know, I know my, I stick to my guns. Like I know my strength is like my, uh, the aesthetic of my prophecy. 
or like yeah. the aesthetic of my the type of the aesthetic at my aesthetic and message is my those are that's my strong suit so I would never veer you would off. never compromise that yeah yourself. yeah and I've honestly had requests for commissions where there has been really too much and I it's like I you know I don't want to do this I don't really want to do this you know no Fair. thanks that's not my work anymore but so, uh yeah yeah it's been going great been great having mainstream um, patronage. Wonderful. Understood. Going back to kind of themes that are dear to your heart, and you were alluding to this in Fresh Air, I'm wondering, you were, you were talking about kind of the immigrant body in these times and futures. We're living in very unusual times, and despite the quiet, generative place you're in, obviously a bit of a dystopian reality for many. Yeah. How does, what works are inspiring you right now, and what do you see in terms of futures for new Canadians, for immigrants, in light of the disparities COVID has, uh, in, ess in essence, made visible? Yeah, um, in terms of what, I'll answer the second question first, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah. I would much rather be spending time thinking about the future of Indigenous populations, both up here and in down in the States. Like the Hopi and Navajo nations are severely be it's just like that's just like an open genocide of lack of funds and care for an entire population of indigenous peoples so it's like those are the type of things i mean i understand canada and its propaganda for immigrants as being some kind of a promised land and like and all of the problems entailed with that and like our labor and building this country and the way that's exploited like all the, all that stuff um but that what has been really taking up my attention a lot more is the treat is the treatment of the first people on this continent uh, that I'm living on. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's not a guilt. It's not a guilt thing. It's just uh, it's not. And it's I'm trying to say that it's not fury, but I'm pretty angry about that. Like I'm pretty angry about it. Um, and then in terms of the work that is that has inspired me during this time, it's it's. Um, efforts to to make those situations better it's not artwork and it's not I mean cultural production I understand and there's been a lot of like it's not lip service but it's like there's been a lot of you know kudos to artists for making this time bearable I'm like kudos to the people on the ground and making things better in impossible situations trying their best and just like doing a GoFundMe or just doing something you know and they're out there putting their lives at risk like uh, and in a lot of cases, like in those in those reserves and in those um, communities, there you know there's it's a lifestyle change that they have to facilitate, which entails a lot of like iso like culturally inappropriate isolation and things like that. So it's like so it's like those that's the work that's actually the work that I've been. So um, yeah, no, it's nice to hear you say that. By, inspired by yeah yeah, it's the work of people and not necessarily specific yeah. artworks of but but people on the people. ground. It's the real work, like actual work that is like scary and dirty and uh, and uh, and uh, time consuming. Like it's yeah. easy for, yeah. I mean, I there are lots of times where I feel really useless making work about the future of, of bodies that, of peoples who don't have a place in this world. But it's like, but it's like, you know, I, I always feel like I should be doing more and I should be, uh, doing some other things as well. What do you feel? I mean, you just obviously alluded to two nations and their marginalization. What do you feel the future of bodies that are marginalized in this world will be in light of COVID? Do you think some people have alluded to COVID potentially setting us back from the climate, the climate, um, the climate movement in a, in essence, kind of a potential space where we can regress. Do you? As someone who looks into futures and world building, do you think it's an opportunity for progression or what do you see as the pandemic plays out? Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's a, don't be sorry for that incredible question. Um, so, let me just give me one second to think about Take that. Take your time. Yeah. When this is over, we have to do our very best to come together and figure out the technology for us to come together in gr the greatest numbers possible to topple what's happening. Like what has happened with COVID-19 is honestly like 
like the the um the there was a pipeline that was running that we were protesting here by blocking um rail railroads railways that because of covid-19 we, it's now a legal protest so when you illegalize protest um because of a pandemic that's something that that like i although i understand that we've got to stay home and we've got to stay safe that's something that in can like canada makes a mild can the canadian government makes a mild situation of it but it has gone so severely wrong where like corporate interests who are behind governments have actually just been pushing their interests while people are inside at home and like and like obsession with social media and like being absorbed by social media and not really be, being able to pay attention to the world around you and respond to it properly that really helps them so like that's something that i would say coming out of here anyone who's watching like please be aware that this is something that they really want they really want us to do this and stay at home and like feel sad and helpless it's not the case so we have to innovate so that we can get out and like change we have to change this shit sorry we have to change this this stuff what's going on we have to change we have to topple the agendas like those agendas are done that's over we can we we if we if you have kids you have to be out there and not regress and go on um no, I, I'm glad you shared that, Raji. We've got some questions from the audience, and I think then we're going to move back into art, pra art practice, your art practice. Okay. But um, Anjali Patel is asking about the works on the walls behind you. Hi, Anjali. Yeah, so, so on this side are two um, marbled paper, two pieces of marbled paper that have been purchased from above ground art supply store. So I did not do those. And then on this side is a Ikea shelf that I painted a snake uh, on the wall. I did a mural in my house. At first, this mural that's in my house was a garden, like a botanical scene that was tremendously like intricate. And then, you know, when you do something and you spend really long and then you, uh, this has happened to me actually a couple times in like the past five months or so where you spend really long on something and you're hopeful, but you keep pushing till the end because you're just like a committer. And then the mood is way off at the end. And I was like, I hate that. So then I painted it white again and it was dark tones and it took so long to paint it white. But then I did the snake on top and I like this feeling a lot more. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I like it too, man. I was like, okay, this is more like it. This is the feeling <laughs> that I wanted. So if Traveler is your latest series, and in, as, as we were kind of alluding to, bringing kind of the dystopian reality of the world and your arts practice together for a second, is COVID, in, is this moment inspiring you in terms of a new body of work? And are you able to share where you're going in your own mind? Yeah, okay. So, so um, a situation like this, uh, a situation like this really exaggerates the precarity of, of um, displaced humans. Like it can really, like people are stuck and they're stuck and there's no aid and there's no help. And like, that's actually, been, this is something that now we're looking at and it's like highlighted and like bright neon, but it's like, this is something that's really actually been going on for a very, very long time. And people who get stuck because of politicians and corporations, people get stuck in one place, they get stuck they get stuck um, irretrievably. They get stuck away from like their families and their children and, and uh, they don't have healthcare and things like that. They're, that's something, this is something that's been going on for so, so long. And uh, that, that is something that's much more in my work is, and it's funny because like aesthetically these issues don't really show up in my work. Um, the, and by uh, these issues, I mean, I mean the, um, the uh, sorry, the forceful displacement of of um, right. people who don't belong in one place or another. Me coming from not one place and another place helps me, I think, dial in to that that feeling. Like we, my family escaped as war refugees from Sri Lanka, and we came here. Um, we didn't come here. We were in New York State, kind of like floating around for a year, and then we made it across the border. But it's like, but. In the in I mean COVID nineteen and the issues that come out of that. Yes, I make pollution wear, but I was making pollution wear before COVID nineteen. I've been making pollution wear for almost one year now. This is one that's going into the Phi Center 
um, and you might have seen the mm -hmm. photograph. Um, yeah, so this is a pollution mask that's like, has been kind of intensely, it became really intense. Um, so uh, this is just, um, it's decorated with like leather. There's like lace. This is made in Sri Lanka. This stuff is called Biralu. It's made by women in the South. There's like brass on it. So it's like making pollution wear for a really long time. It's funny because I get a mess lot of messages about, you know, masks and, oh, you were doing masks. It's like, yeah, I was doing masks because, you know, I was thinking about, the, I was thinking about like this, the personal and spiritual protection of like people uh, in the future who don't come from anywhere and have to go everywhere. So at the heart, so yeah, in response to COVID-19, I think that's as much, it's not very, it's not really responding to like the immediate situation per se. And I don't think it will. No, and that's fair. And, I'm, and it doesn't yeah, have to. This is my, the issues yeah. in travel are like, they're like, they span like this, this certain body of time that's like, that's like large. So yeah, on like a microcosmic level, yeah, it does respond in that we now have to find different ways of protection, but it's like, we, we don't want to put too many plastics on our body. We don't, do you want to use things that like, you know, uh, Euro, do you want, do we, we want to use technology as immigrants that, that as Euro, Eurocentric in the way that it makes you feel when you wear it and things like that. That's the stuff that's like, you know, that I, brings up to four. Speaking yeah. of which, I'm just going to share this. This is a mask yeah. in terms of masks. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration and work that gets into fabrics and fashion and the piece you just showed us? Yeah. Um, I'd love to know more. Yeah. So this piece is one that I made in my house. Um, the, this is just like leather suede and brass jewelry um, on a functional like 3M, 9M mask. So this is a dust mask. It's not like a pathogen. It's not like an anti-pathogen. Everything that I use, I mean, it's either fume or dust protection. It's not really like the pathogen, like the, the cotton mask that we're being asked to wear. But, uh, but yeah, I just got the mask and I just started embellishing it by myself, like on the floor of my last apartment on DuPont, actually. It was just, and like, when, was when like was this? Was this about a year ago or? This is for the Traveler. So a Traveler had like a full, I had a full solo show at uh, Patel, at the time it was Patel Division um, on Ernest Ave, 40 Ernest Avenue. So the whole gallery, I had the division and the Arsenal side and it was, uh, it was, the show was called Traveler and that show is traveling now to to um, Tramway Glasgow, uh, and it'll be there at the end of the year. So this yeah. will likely be in that show as well. But this is one of like quite a few pollution wear uh, pieces, sculptures. No, it's just interesting in terms of this, uh, of all of us in masks and social distancing and not trying, I mean, just seeing the, what you just did, the yeah. work is beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. I have one more question about collaboration but I also want to invite people who are watching to please ask questions because this is a great rare opportunity to be in Rajni Ferrer's living room, which I'm really enjoying seeing oh, your yes. space. Oh, come on Rajni. in, come on in, virtual. Um, so in terms of collaboration, you've also been collaborating in woodwork and furniture and um, yeah. is it Yorgo? Am I getting that? Yorgo Liapis, you got it. So Tell us. Yorgo, yeah, Yorgo is my friend. Um, yeah. We met, uh, Oh my God, we met when I started a studio on Sterling Avenue, Sterling Road, sorry, across from the MoCA, where the MoCA is now. And, uh, you know, we just did studio visits and and he was like, yeah, I really like your work. I was like, and I saw his, I was like, oh my God, you're such a gifted, incredibly gifted woodworker. Uh, let's collaborate on a piece. And then we had one collaboration that went into Gallery 44, which was a huge gold upside down throne that floated off the ground and it's a whole situation but this uh, this piece in particular is called talisman so this is like a fully hand carved pop solid poplar wood piece of Beautiful. it's not functional so you can't sit because okay. yeah we're just i'm just not at that level yet um and i was kind of like can people sit and he's like oh with the shape it's like it's just gonna be rough so mm -hmm. so it just it does this thing where it balances energy so the the story of talisman is based around this like this uh, incredible story of two cities in Egypt that were warring and one was depleted to the point uh, of uh, erasure from history. And then this gives it, this piece of furniture gives the, the cities a chance to sit down and have a conversation again. Hmm. Um, I, I will go back quickly to fresh air and just ask you to talk a little bit about your technique in mixed media. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit, especially for those who, again, may not as, be as well versed in your work, about your studio practice and what you're working with and how large this piece is, et cetera? Yeah, I think this piece is pretty big. I think it's like three, three feet by four feet. Mm -hmm. um, it might be even larger. I think it might be like 40 by 60 or something. It's kind of, it's kind of long. No, it's three by four. It's three by four. So this is a paper piece where I stretch paper kind of like you would canvas. And then there's a lot of mix. I mean, when you say mixed media, like I'll just, I'm really results oriented. So I'll use whatever I need to use to get the, the result that I want um, within archival reason. Um, and this is like a whole bunch of things. It's like a curl gouache. There's charcoal, there's chalk, there's gel pens, there's uh, ink, there's watercolor. What else is there? Some acrylic probably in the color, in color, whatever color I needed it to be that maybe I couldn't get it from another medium. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this you're, you're, yeah. You're not thinking, you're not thinking, and I've had the pleasure of visiting your studio. You're not necessarily thinking, oh, this is going to be an X material versus Y. I've seen you just using what is at hand. I've always used what's at hand and that is yeah. like as budgets get bigger that's a really good point as budgets get bigger and like larger institutions want larger or more intricate or like expensive work now I know how to be economical because I had that experience that's yeah. invaluable being poor is an invaluable experience I feel sorry for you guys that have not had that experience um, finally I want to talk a little bit more just about world building do you feel, and I've said this a few times in this conversation, do you feel we're living in a bit of a dystopia or do you feel we're at the cusp? I mean, you look at space travel, you talk about space being influenced by yeah. anger and... Yeah. Yeah, so, so thanks for bringing up space travel. Like that's the metaphor that I use for a lot of these, these figures um, as they make their way through terrain that's like really dangerous and, or impo seeming, seemingly impossible um, into a place where they're, where they're like vibrant, um, alive uh, and thriving, right? So it's yeah. like, so it's like, um, so it's like, let me just think about that for one second. Take your time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the work itself, can you give me the question again? Just like yeah, I was just thinking about how space travel, space travel is such a big inspiration for you, and we've talked about this a little bit before. There was and, something before, though, Viviani. Well, just something. just that I, I was I, I feel like your world building is a big part of your practice, and I feel we're living in an almost dystopian reality dystopia right now. Dystopia and space travel. So, like, how can we talk yeah. about it together? Like, okay, let's talk about science fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Science fiction is at the is at the heart of my practice. Like, I grew up on science fiction. Like, I since I was what three years old, I saw my first sci fi thing and like completely addicted to it. I was, I'm wearing a Star Wars t-shirt right now. I didn't even mean to do this for the interview. That's just my wardrobe. <laughs> so it's like, so it's like, um, yeah, science fiction is something that, something, science fiction is really valuable to brown people, um, black people, uh, displaced people, immigrants, and refugees. The reason for that is like is that science fiction is actually a window. Like when they want to call it a subgenre, that's off. That's like way, and they actually call it a subgenre as an elitist way of like rubbing it out of academia somehow. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, oh, science fiction, it's on the side. There's a lot of fiction there. Sorry, darling. There's not enough stats. There's not enough figures in that. It's like, no, these are people who are prophesizing and satirizing the mechanism of the present day and prophesizing about how that leads to a future that can be precarious for one group or another. And like, how do we then navigate that? How can we be smart for that when the time comes? How can we be more compassionate for that when the time comes? So it's like, for me, science fiction is about straight up like preparedness. Mm. That's what I really like about sci-fi is that it'll set you up. It'll set you up to use your imagination in the place where you know you're not welcome maybe or like your time is up as somebody who's oppressing like it'll set you up so it's like that's what i, I like that's what i hope my work can do 
I feel that's more important now. It's 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 extremely important now, more than ever, maybe, more to have I'm imagined sorry. possible futures. And that's why I think it's very exciting to think yeah, about that, whether it's in it's also exciting because the future is brown. The future is actually colored. It's not white. It isn't white. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> Fair. Not, yeah, and that's what in the work, that's something like maybe I'm doing a brand of science fiction that sets the world up for that. I hope, I hope so. Mm. That's what I hope to do. By centering brown, black bodies, brown yeah, bodies. Just colored bodies, traveling bodies who can't, couldn't be in the place who are subjects of colonization, who are victims of colonization. They're just being thrown around the world. Like how can they protect themselves? That's what Traveler is about. Yeah. I know it ends up looking very pretty, but like the issues behind it are like deep, far, deep and far reaching. Thank you for giving us insight into the series. I love it. Um, I'm not going to let you go quite yet because there's one more question that's of just course. come in. And I hope that there's more questions. I love questions. It's nice to spend time with you. Hi, Rajni. Your work is inspiring and awesome. This is Nisha. What advice do you have for other artists that are starting out during this time, especially when galleries are closed and opportunities seem scarce? Oh, my God. Or any advice you can single out about uh, out from your many years of self-representation. Yeah, that's a tall order. I mean, yeah, self-rep is always, definitely just have it as the way to go anyway. That should be our baseline is like ability to self-rep and like self-produce, self-motivate and promote. We're, I mean, if you have a smartphone and you're on the internet, the likelihood is high of you being able to independently produce and disseminate your information and your cultural product. Like that's just like a given and you can do that now. You should do that before any gallery, before anybody was like, let me help you move your ideas. Like, yeah, yeah, move your ideas. It's set up for you to do it now. You can, everyone can do it. Most people can do it. So it's like, so it's like, uh, uh, that would be my advice. Don't rely on, I mean, I, you know, the thing about institutions is that, is there, the thing I like about institution is the, is if in the best, is in the best of circumstances, their capacity for change and that effect. That's the best thing. Institution as static does not interest me. I mean, that's not, you know, why are they even there? If museums aren't changing, why are they even there? Like they can't be archaic, like they become useless and a waste of money to be quite honest. So it's like, you can't wait on them to innovate you can't, you can't rely on uh, institutional innovation uh, for your practice to prosper. Like you have to do that. So my advice for uh, artists who are emerging right now, having a hard time, um, just like, you know, chill, find other ways of possibly making income, but like use what you've got like around you, whatever is a bird and a string, like wrap it around, like make it really beautiful. So it's like, do, use what you have around you for now, and but you should have innovation top of mind. You should always be moving, not only your practice, but like it's it's the way that it's that it's consumed, the way that it becomes useful to the world. That's on you. You have to figure it out. Because to be honest, like you know, it's really nice to talk always to talk to Viviani. So I'm like yes, but like a lot of talks have just been like, you know, no, like this is it's not you know it doesn't interest me to just like to just like do do free work and like all these things like to be honest AG with the AGO like I'm really grateful for the acquisition but it's because of you Debbie that I'm doing this talk you know like you're a really valuable person to me but it's like we should it's on me like it's on us to innovate how we're gonna because even in the future you know the way that art is consumed and the way that art is disseminated and like the whole structure of the entire gallery system like that whole thing's gonna it's got to change like those things don't can't stay the same. It doesn't make sense for, for that much longer, right? We're trying to enter a new world and make a new world. So like, you have to do that. You have to think and be like, how, do, how where is my place? What's, what's my place there? How can I make my place there? Thank you for sharing that. So to come full circle and close us out, because valuing your time too, you started talking about just this beautiful generative quiet of being in isolation. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're spending your time and any advice to people of how to kind of get through challenging circumstances if you're on your own or. Yeah. And I am, I am. Um, pay attention to yourself and like the things you want. There's a lot of like reliance on this right now that I'm seeing people lean really hard on to the point where I was just like, you know what? I don't want to do that. I just, I don't really want to do it. I'm using it for promotion of my work, like in abs, in the absence of physical contact with my, pro with my things that I make. 
but it's just like, I don't need to rely on that for attention. I don't want that for love. I don't want, like, these are the things that I feel like people should be paying attention to themselves, uh, finding ways to love themselves, care about yourself, care about, because that only leads to care for your community and care for your surroundings, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I'm just like figuring out this like weird spiritual pathway through myself into my community and to others around me. That's something, it takes up a lot of time and like it feels, yeah, sometimes it feels hella lonely, but it's like, that's really worth it. We've been really trained to, to absorb our self-love, to absorb our love for ourselves from external sources like stimulation and like romantic interests and like eating taste with sweets or going shopping, which is the worst. But it's like, but it's like, you know, can you just be the something that I've said before? It's like, can you just be by yourself and like chill by yourself without purchasing anything? Like without, you know, watching Netflix, uh, doing a Netflix binge? Like, can you just like read it? Just be, or just be quiet by yourself. That's something that I'm getting you know, an hour of or so every day. And it's been so good for me personally, mm -hmm. you know, and this and is, and I'm also not like, I don't come from like a mental bill of clean health of, in any way. Like I struggle with depression and anxiety, like these things that yes, most people my age, yes, we're afflicted. We're afflicted with these disorder, not disorders, but like these mental conditions. Right. So it's like, so it's like that has been actually the most helpful. And I can tell you that it could probably work for like a ton of us. Mm. and are are you and again like you're saying you don't need to make right now you don't need to plan yeah. but are you making for your own joy for yourself like I see the table in front of you or are oh, yeah. you just this hot mess um yes. I, <laughs> I have some work here that's like okay I'll give you an example of you know yeah my you know I've been on a production schedule for like three years now right like you know this because it's one thing after the other after the other and like building self-care and resting time in between it which is like you have to do it otherwise you fall apart but like one thing I did was this so like I just moved I just moved here right and the lights are the lights are not good and I'm I've started designing lights with my friend Kate McNeil and she runs Concord Custom Lighting which is the nice. best custom lighting firm in the city I don't care what anybody says so uh, I designed lights with her. And so I came up with these lights for my home. And oh, very I the whole draft and I figured out the scales and we figured out the materials together. And like, these are the kinds of things. So I'm skill building too, doing design skill building. Industrial design, furniture design. Oh, I love it's the this. Whole, it can be, it doesn't fantastic. have to be boring and like tacky. Lights can be so beautiful and like sensibly priced and like they can, don't have to be expensive or anything to make your own thing. So it's like, so it's like that and like doing plans for the future. I just, I didn't set these up here, they're just here. Um, this is a sculpture that's gonna be 10 feet tall. So I just was on the phone with another artist about uh, uh, constructing the armature for this uh, statue and like how I can interlock that and safely ship it with all the substrate around it. So this, and this is a traveler figure that's gonna be 10 feet tall. It's gonna show wow. at, uh, at, at Tramway in Glasgow in Scotland. Beautiful, Rajni. I'm so I feel very gift. I feel we're all very fortunate to get a sense of your private death space and how you are. And uh, now my daughter will be here in two weeks, and now it's private. Just for now, it's private. So enjoy the peace and quiet. And thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Viviani. You're the best. Take care. Bye. Bye.